Welcome to another Speak of the Devil. Today I'm being joined by the High Priest and High Priestess of the Church of Satan, the Maestro Magus Peter H. Gilmore and Magistrate Peggy Nadramia. How are both of you today? Oh, we're great. Thanks for having us again. <laughs> it's really nice because though uh -oh. we have spoken... What was that? Doggy toy oh, doggy attack. Doggy toy attack. <laughs> Sudden squeaking from another room. You will be hearing some of that. <laughs> Having two wolflets running around the house can yeah. have its own adventures. It is quite a right. It's expected. Plus, I mean, we love our animals. It's okay if they get an inter interruption. Um, we, we've all uh, spoken individually and collectively before, but this is the first time live on video. And so, of course, this is going to be live on tape. Everyone's going to be seeing this right, after right. the act, but it's really nice to see both of you. You look fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank As you. Do you. You look pretty good yourself. <laughs> so, Always the dapper gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> I try. I try. Um, every time we have an opportunity to speak, I always want to try to bring something new to the conversation. Uh, mix it up a little, if you will. Uh, this time, I'd really love to talk about the challenges of administering an organization, a religion, in an age of social media. And this is something that has never, just never even existed before now. And so there must be original complications that you're experiencing that even at the founding of the Church of Satan didn't even have to consider. Um, so that's going to be the broad premise. But the discussion, I'm hoping we can break it up into a couple different sections just uh, for the course, uh, you know, to, to move through the discussion logically here. And because I tend to ramble, I had to write down for myself the structured notes that we're going to be going through. Um, and so if you will allow me just to uh, give a, a, a quick... Uh, framing of this first question, we can just sort of dive right into this. Sure. Uh, part of the allure, I think, of the early Church of Satan, uh, for virtually everyone who discovers it, no matter how they discover it, is the exoticism element of it. Uh, it was initially introduced to the world through uh, formalized rituals, uh, dirty magazines, uh, and, and periodicals. And so, as a Satanist, discovering this religion for the first time you see this exotic display of what satanism is and then when you dive into the literature you realize that this is pure carnal excitement celebration of the individual and that idea is very different um can you guys talk to me about how it was for you discovering this this exotic creature satanism for the first time well uh, for me, uh, you know, it was finding the Satanic Bible uh, in a bookstore in uh, the Port Authority. Uh, when I was buying all the science fiction books, uh, since that was my favorite literature at the time, well, with some horror too. Uh, but just reading it and going, wow, this uh, is exotic and strange, but it reflects me precisely. And almost the um, picture of Doctor on the back sort of almost put me off because I thought, oh, who's this, this guy? You know, he looks like me and what's going on? Like, are, are, is this just going to be Ballyhoo or is it going to be something that actually amounts to something? And of course it did and really kind of was nifty that way. You had a different entree to it. Uh, well, I discovered it through reading uh, The Devil's Avenger, that slim little book that'll now cost you like $750 on eBay. Um, I found it in a, a, a shopping bag full of uh, books my aunt had passed on to my mom to read, because uh, in my family they were always uh, passing paperbacks around. And um, I was flipping through them, and um, suddenly there's this weird little exotic-looking book. So I grabbed it, and I read it. And, you know, The Devil's Avenger does have um, nuggets of the satanic philosophy in it. It is expressed in there. But it, to me, even more, it had this whole lifestyle of these two kooky people who lived in San Francisco and liked all the same things I did and lived in a black house and didn't care what other people thought about them and, you know, would have their friends over for, you know, these elaborate exotic costume parties and satanic rituals. And it just really spoke to me, like coming from an Irish Catholic background with a very kind of... Uh, it was like a, living in a, a village where everyone was watching you and judging you and, you know, evaluating your behavior. And we only kept to ourselves. We didn't really go outside the, the whole uh, clan, as it were. Uh, this was just such a great 
like a breath of fresh air, kind of as a, like a 15 year old, it's said to me, like, you can do whatever you want with your life. You don't have to be stuck in this backward, um, kind of patriarchal thing anymore. You can do whatever you want. So, uh, then I went on to read the Satanic Bible and the other books. Yeah. Um, it wasn't long before you were both, uh, recognized as, uh, powerful voices in Satanism, and you uh, were invited to begin uh, uh, representing the religion and the organization in media. What, was, uh, what were some of the challenges you experienced as uh, early administrators and spokespersons uh, for the organization? Well, it was, it was kind of neat that, that uh, Anton LaVey recognized us as really having a grasp on the philosophy. And after we had submitted our active applications and they were accepted, we were immediately invited to go visit. And when we visited, it was really wonderful and we really hit it off well. And, and he was just like, you guys can speak for me. And uh, at the time, though, it was uh, pre-internet. And we had to work with publications that were out there. And of course, we started the Black Flame, which was the world's first satanic newsstand magazine. You could find it anywhere. Tower was distributing it worldwide. Wow. So it's kind of nifty that we, we got a voice of Satanism out there. Because this was a period uh, when uh, there were some detractors like the Temple set out there trying to say the Church of Satan had died. Anton LaVey had gone underground. And, retired. Uh, retired. And it was... The organization had dissolved. Fizzled out or something. And we were kind of saying, well, we're in it, like, ooh, that's not true at all. And uh, by sort of putting ourselves out there, suddenly all these other people kept saying, yeah, and we're out here too. And, and we could do what we continued to do, and especially as we moved into running the organization of celebrating the creativity of the members, because the Church of Satan is its members. It, it's not just Anton LaVey and what he's doing. Uh, it's taking his writings and philosophy and applying them. And we kind of did that right from the start. We didn't really wait for anybody to, to kind of tell us what to do. We, we, we took the bull by the balls and start our own publication like right away and said we're going to be out there and talk about satanism to the globe and and did and uh yeah i got to sally jesse raphael show was my very first media appearance and that was you know nation worldwide you know it was like that's how i started like boom nationwide right TV. In front, yeah yeah, and never stopped. Uh, so I, it became natural for, for both of us to, to communicate what Satanism was to people. And uh, Peggy became, you know, once uh, Anton LaVey died, uh, we had talked about the idea that the internet was growing because he'd go online and look at things that turned him on, you know, the, all the different kind of things he was interested in, guns, women. Uh, well, he found <laughs> the um, the narrow casting of the, the internet really fascinating that you could go find a you know, a, an alt uh, news group that just liked, like, very specific fetishes and interests. Chubby chicks. Chubby chicks <laughs> and uh, chicks who pee on themselves. And, you know, he, he was fascinated by that, that, yeah. you know, instead of this uh, media that we were all afraid was going to homogenize everything, it actually catered to the uh, specific whims of small special interest groups. Oh yeah, every fetish was being paraded. And that, this was before there was any kind of real visuals online, but people could discuss things. Yeah. And so then the um, chat room started to happen and Peggy became our first uh, online representative. Well, I was, yeah, I represented, in the, represented the Church of Satan on the alt-Satanism which, um, you know, is now this legendary news group where incredible flame wars occurred. The first places that I met people like um, uh, Ken Asfile and uh, Bill M and people like that was, were, were in all Satanism. Yeah, Magister Frost and Magister Slaughter were, yeah. were like major figures yeah. of getting this thing up and running to, to get discussions about Satanism happening. Well, um, Magister Frost had, uh, as virtually a teenager, had his own uh, dial-in BBS bulletin board system, and so did uh, Magister Slaughter. Um, they were both barely out of their 20s, I think, when they were doing them, and I encountered them early on because I dial in to these <laughs> things through my 14400 modem, and, uh, it, you know, I'd be in, talking to these young guys that I now know like for 20 years um, 
and but there was so much um like the temple of said had such a big footprint on the early uh internet that uh all you had to do was raise your head and say well i'm a member of the church of satan and it's not dead and i've met anton LaVey, and and they were on you like a swarm of locusts trying to <laughs> shout you down so it was that was really the beginning of the end of that you know misnomer that there was such church of thing as the church of satan and and a lot of members of the you know we have members of the temple of set that are still in the church of satan that just quit and joined the church of satan because they're like oh okay we, we were listening to this bozo over here over yeah here. like yeah. oh okay now we'll listen because <laughs> people joined that thinking that you know yeah. the propaganda was true mm -hmm. and then suddenly they're like wait a minute no they release a church say well what am i wasting my time with this seti and bullshit yeah, yeah. So i really am a satanist and i never really you know, wanted yeah, to call myself it, that other thing they so. were just kind of tolerating it because they thought yeah. it was the only thing that was available but um magister nemo was the ones who particularly right. you know said that magister he, he said that you know i had been you know kind of misled and then I sort of walked in, he had the whole image where he said, I walked into a bar and there was there was me sitting at the bar drinking something very interesting. And he was like, so what's that? And I said, it's pure, unadulterated Satanism. <laughs> he was like, oh, well, I want a sip of that. So, proof. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So. so anyway, that's how it started. Well, if we can take a step back from the online world before you were able to dial in, I, and I just want to touch on this really quickly. I don't think people appreciate the dialing into the internet. Like that was a process and you had to have a, like, yep. a dedicated open line and there was a be -do, be -do. Yeah. And sometimes it just hung up on you and you had to keep trying. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> pain, and weird so. stuff would happen. Yeah. Well, you people who just I pick remember, up your phones, you don't know what. <laughs> remember you you try to actually then try to call your friends or your family and you would get that <laughs> you're like god damn it. He's on the internet again. This is going to go on for hours. Yeah. So uh, oh, those God. are the days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had our old Atari computer back yeah, then. Yeah. We started with the Commodore 64, which we were using to typeset Groove. Yeah. And then we got our Atari. And when we got our Atari, that's when we started doing the well, Black I, Flame. You know, I was on the internet for years with a text-only feed. I had no graphics. I had ASCII code. And uh, you, you dial into a, um, a BBS and, uh, you know, a graphic would come up that was all made out of ASCII code. So it'd be like, a big, like, hello, you know, and there'd be a, you know, a Baphomet made out of like ones and twos. Yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. crazy. Um, so before we had that, there was a grotto system that was uh, formulated, like formally created um, in the ch early Church of Satan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why it was uh, disbanded? Well, I've learned more about that recently because I've been, as you know, doing this archive project and I've, um, you know, had access to a lot of the correspondence and um, the grotto system broke down and disbanded in the mid 70s um, for all the same reasons it did the second time, which is that it's just not a viable paradigm. Um, Satanists aren't all going to get along in general, mm -hmm. but they especially aren't going to all get along just because they live in a certain geographical area. Uh, you've got a lot of different personality types, uh, sometimes the same personality type, um, that were being lumped together. They didn't get along. Someone would always want to be the leader, and there would always be someone grumbling about that underneath them. Um, the grottos themselves were never very big, um, in case anyone has the idea that they were these big, you know, concerns that were never more than, like, at the largest grotto may have had 10 people. They were usually around five people. Um, one grotto in particular, and this is um, documented, um, you know, discussed in Michael Aquino's <laughs> Church of Satan PDF file that you can find online. Um, they, they got involved in drug sales. And um, petty theft. And petty theft. Um, okay. So, it will, yeah, and the thing is about grottos is that you're picking someone basically, you know, out of nowhere, uh, someone you may have never even met, and letting them have some kind of authority over the other members in their area. Uh, you don't know what they're doing. 
you don't know what they're going to get into. And they've got the Church of Satan imprimatur right on them. Like, here we are, we're official grotto. Here's our certificate. It's hanging on the wall. Yeah. Um, no good. Uh, not something you want going on. No, and as soon as that was discovered, those people were expelled yeah. and the grotto disbanded immediately. Right, of course. But the fact is that people were getting into grottos based, basically based on correspondence. Right. And if somebody could write a good, you know, facade letter to you people the, you know, the doctor and the and uh, diane would sort of look and they go well they seem like they're yeah. going to be supportive and loyal and they seem to understand it so we'll give them a shot and uh sometimes things went horribly wrong yeah uh, but and also it's... people just got into conflicts a lot they that did. was the real problem yeah because um and this especially especially became true the second time around but it was also true the first time around you give a person a title of grotto leader and suddenly they became these little mega maniacal yeah, <laughs> tyrants you know and they start issuing edicts and telling people you have to be here at a certain time and you better wear this and what are you doing wearing that and it was so not satanic no well, it was a total um, leaky inner tube test and yeah, there were a lot absolutely. of leaky inner tubes i gotta say yeah so you know the very best grottos happen organically among people who already know each other and like each other and want to get together and do this or that. Some grottos like to just socialize and watch a movie and have dinner and other grottos are very strictly want to do a ritual every single week. And, you know, some people would get mad because like, well, I don't want to do one every week. And, you know, some people and others would be like, why didn't we do one last month? I needed to do one. Like, well, what's stopping you doing by yourself? Um, <laughs> And it became like that, and it was like the central office didn't want to sit there and sort out these people's petty, you know, personal disagreements. Yeah, get out of here. Beef. So yeah, well, it's see the thing more that, trouble than it was worth. Right. Let's put it that way. The right, you know, in the ideal situation, it sounds beautiful, wonderful, wasn't oh, this great? It, the ideal was very rarely the real, unfortunately. Right. See, what seems to work is if people live near each other and are friends, then they just do things together. They don't have yeah. to formalize it as a grotto. It's like if you want to do a ritual together, the people who want to ritualize can do that. Have a ball. You know, pick whoever's chamber you like best and bring you know the right yeah. implements to make it a you know really exciting ritual. Like work together to plan the music. But rituals is, is not supposed to be everybody's major concern. It's like Satanism is about applying the philosophy and getting out in the world and actually doing something. Right. So just simply going to like a cool museum or a local interesting historical place, or even going to the movies together or a great restaurant. Like or those bowling. Are, yeah, awesome, <laughs> awesome things you can do with other people. And, you know, that you share that, that your Satanist is a great thing, but you have to have other interests in order to socialize with people to make it actually have any kind of depth and have them as your friends. And uh, so it, again, it became like, when it got formalized, things would go sour because suddenly people would try to imply some kind of hierarchy. And uh, it just would always just alienate people and anger people and frustrate people. And then everybody who was all nettled would come to the central office and say, well, we're all nettled about this. And it's like, well, you know, that's your They'd guys' They'd fire problems. off a letter. Yeah, it's like, you know, <laughs> And, you know, because no that was the way of the world back then, because we didn't have email. Yeah. Uh, Long-distance phone calls were expensive. Uh, yeah. We'll forget that, too, is another old old tech. The farther away you are, the more expensive the phone call. Hmm. We don't have it anymore. Uh, but, you know, they'd sit down and they'd fire our dear high priest. I have, it has come to my attention. You know, and who wants to deal with that every day, you know, the yeah. mail? Well, it was bad with the mail. It got worse once there was, uh, you know, email, because well, then that, people that could, was more our yeah. Well, that was that <laughs> we had to deal with because suddenly we would get grottos out there that were trying to turn themselves into their own competitor, the Church of Satan. Oh, and yeah. they so I don't know if Adam is ready to go to that part yet. He's yeah, trying. yeah. <laughs> let's. Um, okay. I do want to start talking about communication, though. Um, before I do, I, I just want to back up to this point because I think it's so important that you guys have just mentioned simply because you identify as Satanists or simply because you live in an area close to other Satanists does not mean you're de facto going to get along. And more to the point, it's suffocating if all you're doing, it's stifling in individualism and just living your life. If all you're doing is getting together and talking about Satanism, <laughs> every time you get to, like i i can count on my one hand how many times i've actually sat down and had just satanic conversations with other satanists when we get together it's always about something else like it's yeah so well, you know, rare. 
it's satanic to have conversations about things you enjoy. Like when we would be out with Dr. LeVay, yeah, of course we talked about the philosophy in the organization, but we'd go to gun shows, we'd go to reptile shows, we'd go to cool restaurants, we'd go to interesting places together so that, you know, the satanic conversations are about whatever you really enjoy, not just the philosophy of Satanism. Now, of course, like some people who've never had that chance to do that, it's really exciting to do that, you know, it's, but it's kind of an introductory, almost first phase sort of thing. Like you get there and you talk about it and you kind of compare notes and it's exciting how you found the philosophy and how people around you reacted to you saying you were Satanist or whether you did or not and how you hit it, you know, however that works. But but that's just the beginning and that you have to move beyond that to something that's that's really more applying the philosophy rather than just talking about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're talking about communication between individual Satanists and the organization. Uh, you both have been involved in this for so long. Have, has there ever been a struggle, a, a sort of balancing between communication to the individual membership and the daily task of having to uh, define and defend Satanism in the greater media at large? Well, um, <laughs> we kind of split the task. We are yeah. fortunate in that. <laughs> We uh, there's two of us, mm -hmm. and uh, he handle. I always say he handles the outer world, and I handle the world inside the Church of Satan. I deal with the members mostly. Um, you know, I deal with the nuts and bolts of processing membership, and I have some help with that. But you know, mostly that's me, and uh, I know who everyone is. Uh, Peter doesn't always. You know, he's like, who's this guy again? You know, Although I know the guy. He lives over there, and it's, it's, he does this, and his wife does this other exciting thing and you know I kind of keep up with things that way so we're fortunate if this was all on one person I don't know <laughs> yeah because I, I say it all the time I couldn't do what he does because I I get impatient explaining Satanism to the outside world I'm always saying like just go read a book like I just you know he'll, he's happy to do it he does it in a very pleasant and you know polite way, whereas I'm more of the bad cop. I'm just like, oh, shut up and read this. <laughs> he asked me something else. That's dumb. Like, you know, so I'm not the one to be interviewed yeah. by these, uh, these other agencies. Do you think that um, just the structure of, of both of you uh, being able to sort of define your own lanes um, of course, it's, it makes it easier to administer an organization like this. Um, is there ever any breakdown with that? Um, and let me, I don't, let me try to define what I mean here. Um, do you ever find yourselves uh, swerving into each other's lanes at times, I guess? Yes. <laughs> do we ever disagree? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. Um, I think the organization is ultimately healthier for the fact that we sometimes, you know, it's it's not this, you know, adamantine solid wall. Sometimes there is a little back and forth between us, but you know, ultimately, he's the boss. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no laugh. <laughs> Well, that's that's what Doctor did too. I mean, when you know, when he worked with, we we could totally see you know from all the stuff that we have that he was like that with Diane. That you know, that he, she would bring up things and Blanche with him too. Like everyone would sort of say, well, think about this, think about that. And I mean, we did it as well. Like you know, we worked with Doctor and said, well, what about this? And we know something about this guy or about this thing. And the thing is, like he would take things into account and he would you know process them and. Then he'd either decide to move in one direction or another. It was always his decision. Um, but uh, he appreciated the support and the, the additional information and opposing points of view, as long as they weren't like really like hostile or something. Right. But constructive criticism is something that we all appreciate. And uh, But, you know, ultimately with the way this organization works, is there's got to be one person where the buck stops, and it's always been the high priest. Yeah. So yeah. that's how we do it. Nice. Um, because there's been so many in the span of the 50 years that this organization has existed, this religion, um, there's been so many different forums of communication. Uh, you know, we, we spoke of just phone calls being more expensive, depending on how far away you were from the source, uh, mail, had the, the act of writing a letter and then patiently or not waiting for a return letter, uh, zines that were released to people who subscribe to them, uh, traditional just print magazines, uh, some that you ha both have been uh, 
the inspiration, you know, the creators of or supporting of. Um, and then with the internet, and we just spoke of dialing into chat rooms and uh, IRC threads, uh, then you had formal chat rooms. Uh, because you have uh, sort of split the communication, um, is it is it easier to manage uh, all these different forms of communication with with the, both of you taking these sort of separate lanes of approach, uh, or I guess maybe what are some of the the bigger challenges you've experienced throughout the time? Do you prefer the mail method to the email method? I guess. <laughs> Well, that ship has sailed. Oh, um, yeah. So what we prefer Take is the emails is down. Irrelevant. Um, you know, I I can tell you that from the early days of the church, that um, one of the, the things Doctor had going for him when he was managing things is that he didn't have to worry too much about members who he knew would butt heads um, getting in touch with each other because there was no place for them to do it mm -hmm. um you know there, there was some of it obviously um you know inside grottos and there was an intercommunication roster that you could sign up for not everyone signed up for it so some people were off in their own little cell and were never contacted by other members and you know never wrote to anybody except central and some of them were or had their only little kooky take on Satanism and they might have had some like unattractive opinions and it didn't matter because no one was ever going to hear from them. No, it was their own, our own application. Yeah. Things. And doctor was, doctor loved that. He, he loved that. He, he knew his members were all, all these different weirdos and he really enjoyed that, uh, that he could keep, you know, in touch with all of them, like the spider in the middle of a giant web of interesting delights and he didn't have to worry about the fact that you know joe blow was going to say you know jane schmain she's not a satanist she should be thrown out of this organization you don't know how much of that we get we get in that, that. Really? and that's because you're all in touch with each other you're all looking at each other um and everybody's got a, an opinion and that's been a uh, that's been a huge challenge, a challenge that the early church did not face at all. Right, because these people really didn't deal with each other. But one of the interesting things, too, is uh, what uh, they had, you know, because they were dealing with people with postal mail. Like, we now have an FAQ section on the website, and I made that out of the uh, sort of standard answers that I had on file. You know, we've always had a vast amount of correspondence. You get hundreds of pieces of email every day, and you have to answer it. So I have, like, about 50 ready-made answers that I just, you know, click on and throw in and, and hit send because there's you can't deal with hundreds of pieces of email unless you can do that. But in the early days when it was postal mail, they had their own FAQ of handout sheets. Yes. And I have just recently um, cataloged uh, a big box of those that I found and um, I sorted them out and I started cataloging them, putting writing down the dates, giving assigning them, you know, numbers. And there are over a hundred of them. Wow. And that was all specifically to, it was to answer specific questions, um, to people to order different things, um, questions about what is Anton LaVey really like? There was a sheet of paper, like a little mini biography. Yeah. There was like, you know, the old autograph pictures. Please send me an autograph yeah. picture. And a pile of those wow. uh, that will go out. Um, there were so many forms uh, involved in the daily correspondence for the at the office of the Church of Satan, that the administrator in chief uh, made herself an index to all the forms, which I also found uh, a, a big office manual of procedure for how to answer specific questions, oh, wow. an office manual of telephone procedures for how to answer the phone at the Church of Satan. It was. You know, those were the days. No computers, so uh, not even you know people didn't have home Xerox machines. Uh, so what did you do? You'd have to run down to the print shop and ask for twenty more copies of how do I join the witch's workshop or something. So it was it was quite 
an undertaking. And when I look at it and think of how lucky I am that I can do this with a computer, you know, I'm very grateful <laughs> because obviously from the amount of handouts and things they had to deal with, they had a huge amount of postal mail because otherwise it wouldn't have generated all of this. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You know, just, the, and the reason of that was because uh, there was always something coming out somewhere, uh, you know, about the Church of Satan, whether it was in a, a magazine, a men's magazine, or in a newspaper. Yeah, and the letters from the Devil column that was in the National the Insider, Insider, that used to generate a large amount of mail from people who weren't even Satanists. They were just curious about Satanism yeah. and Dr. LeVay. So, you know, they'd get, they'd get so many of these, like, you know, lonely Lady Lonely Hearts, you know, letters, like, how do I make a love potion? So he had a little pink handout, like, how to make a love potion. And it's just, because it was just easier. Just send them something, charge them a dollar. And that's what they did. So, you know, they, they'd filch all the dollars at the end of the day, I guess, go out and have dinner, whatever. <laughs> it's a nice way to, to get the... And people got their love potion, you know? So. <laughs> um, do you think that's why so many... Uh, pretenders crop up and aren't able to sustain anything because they don't realize the genuine mm -hmm. structure that's behind an organization like this that they don't realize it and they're not able to respond to it yeah it takes an awful lot of work and they don't realize how much they, you know the other thing too is that most of the, the sort of fly-by-night people who suddenly decide they're going to be like the great white hope of satanism they don't have anything to say that's that's an addition, you know, that, that is anything worthwhile to add to the whole structure of the philosophy. You know, at this point, we've gotten to, to a situation where people are trying to water down Satanism into something that anybody could be. And uh, that's a whole other, you know, thing that's going on. In the past, there would be people who kind of saw Anton LaVey and said, well, he made himself high priest and started a thing. Well, I want to be famous, too. So we are like, I'm going to put on a cape and get some naked chicks to hang around me and take some pictures. I mean, really, I have, I have this stuff in the archives where people were doing this, like they go to some local magazine and, you know, parade around and, you know, put a stuffed owl on a, a tombstone in their living room and go, see, I, I'm running my own satanic church. But they, they weren't Anton LaVey. They didn't have a philosophy. They were just some goofs in a Halloween outfit, like saying, see, see, I'm a Satanist. Look at me. And, and again, we still have that. People still, you know, now it's really easy that, you know, when I started uh, writing a lot about this was when people were setting up their own crappy GeoCities websites. Angel Fire. You know, Angel Fire. Angel like, let's get a spinning skull graphic, you know, in a it's great. <laughs> And suddenly yeah. I'm the church of the, you know, Sephirothic demonic monstrosities. Yeah. And, you know, there they were. And anybody could find that. And, of course, anybody with these answers would just go like, oh, yeah, you're you're 14 and you're, you know, your mother is <laughs> not catching you. You're one kid and you're 17 years old. Yeah, so. Unfortunately, there were scholars. Well, uh, who solid. shall be named? <laughs> who would actually, you know, they'd spend like one night on the, the Internet and write a book about Satanism. You know, and put all these bozos in the book just because they found a website somewhere. That was the the worst thing about the early days of the internet is that everything looked the same in terms of, um, you know, does this have any validity? Well, it's a website. There's a person here. There's an email. I guess it's an organization. Well, it's black with red font. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Well, you know, there was like some idiots, you know, in in Mexico claiming they have like twenty thousand members. And some goofball, you know, who's an academic, like reproduced that and said, wow, this is a really important satanic church. Again, it was nobody. It was some teenager with a website and he knew like a friend or two. But like, you know, nobody would actually try to get some facts on things. They'd simply go by whatever nonsense was online and just take it at face value. And since most of it was just posturing by people who actually had nothing to offer, uh, it, it, a lot of distortions got out there, especially from people who really should have known better. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting because, you know, like you had mentioned that um, LeVay didn't really have to worry about the infighting amongst members or even dissenters, really, because he was sort of, you know, isolated in his own space. Communication wasn't as instantaneous at the beginning. Now, in a time, especially like the early Internet, where there was no such thing as authoritative websites or content. There just was content. And so you just sort of took it at face value and said, oh, well, maybe it's real. Maybe it's not. Who knows? Who knows what's real and yeah. not? Um, so that that was a huge problem with the early Internet. But we're still experiencing that 
to some degree today because like you just mentioned people look back to the early internet for some sort of authority that never even existed are there other um you know, we talked about some of the, the problems with in, Satanists infighting or, or uh, talking smack, really, about each other uh, in modern media that sometimes you guys have to deal with. Are there other problems that you've experienced uh, with modern technology that you don't think LeVay even uh, had to, was even available to be a problem? Well, something changed with journalism uh, in more recent years. Once the blog culture started, people started writing things that were based on opinion rather than fact. And the idea of actually doing research and corroborating details got thrown by the wayside uh, because it doesn't matter if you're just going to be talking about your opinions about whatever you come across. Anybody can come across this, this stuff and offer an opinion on it. So journalists, you could send out a press release and journalists just regurgitate and go, wow, look at this. And they don't check on whether any of it's true at all. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten to a point where literally anybody could declare they have some kind of massive organization and send out press releases. And they'll have idiots out there just simply saying, well, look at that. You know, there's a gathering of 30,000 Satanists about to happen in Peoria. And they put it up there because they don't ever check. Yeah. They don't ever and check. It's, it's also um, the, a lot of these blog style journalists tend to present the facts, like let's say they want to write, I want to do a, a column about the Church of Satan, like answer my questions, here's some questions, blah, blah, blah. So we'll answer them, we'll direct them to our website where all the articles are, which of course they, they don't want to read. And um, then they write some snarky piece that was supposed to be informational, but it's, it, it, it's based on their attitude toward what they would like the Church of Satan to be. <laughs> They'll be like, well, you know, I was wanting it to be more like naked girls again and, and fun like orgies, and it's not. So, so I'm mad. And I don't like that Peter Gilmore guy. He's like, he gives too many rules, you know. And you're like, okay, I thought you were a journalist. You know, if you're just going to give your stupid opinion, then why do we have to waste our time talking to you? Yeah, no, it's, it's very funny that way because we even had that when we did the 6606 thing. We had uh, somebody, we allowed some press into that, and one of the people who was allowed in LA Weekly. Yeah, just basically said, well, it was, they were hoping for like, you know, live sex and blood offerings. <laughs> yeah. And, and we gave them a formal ritual that was kind of done in a style that was bringing together uh, Dario Argento and, yeah. you know, and, well, not really Argento, uh, more, uh, um, I can't think of who it is now. It was uh, a very but, inconsistent way they presented themselves yeah. because on the one hand, they were, they felt that we lack, lacked um, some kind of, uh, you know, old school credibility because we didn't have the naked girls cavorting. Well, we was, had a naked altar, but yeah. she wasn't blowing right. anybody, so they were disappointed. Yeah, so they, that we lacked that kind of old school. But on the other hand, the sincerity and power of the final hundred people yelling "Hail Satan" scared the pants off. That yeah, the guy, guy practically. And he turned, his and then his, his whole write-up turns around to like they're, they're practically like Nazis. So. You know, on the one hand, no credibility. On the other hand, too much credibility. You can't win. Yeah, because we had everybody, losing. you know, stand and rise and give the sign of the horns. And yeah. when they all did that, and, you know, the guy literally, like, you know, lost it. The sincerity so. of those shouts really got to yeah, that so guy's it's, it's like back we, brain. We did kind of a, a hammer horror, you know, yeah. aspect to what we were doing. You know, going back to also going back to the you know, universal black hat and kind of stuff. We were trying to blend a whole bunch of imagery from of Satanism in, in film that uh, had had power. And you know, but because it didn't have like the live sex that this guy thought would, should be essential and like blood everywhere, uh, which he also thought was essential, and it's not, of course. Uh, he just like was shitting on us because it just didn't fulfill whatever wishes or or fantasies he had about what it should yeah. be. Yeah, and instead, I mean, and but. The whole premise was you were going to write an article about what actually happened, mm -hmm. not what you hoped would happen. You know, I went to school for journalism. I have two degrees. It's like we learned better. Yeah. I don't know what they're teaching them today. Well, and, and that brings up a really interesting question because we know virtually anyone that looks at any media nowadays understands that there is no longer a line between journalists and opinion writers. Um, 
not even with the big media, there's not no. much anymore. Absolutely so, not. I'm so how, shocked at some of it. But how do you, as administrators of this organization, determine which representative is going to be an opinion based or a news based? And how do you, do you take a different approach for either of those if you are able to identify it? Well, what I do at this point, we because we get requests like daily for somebody to talk to somebody about something, and uh, nowadays every school kid that can can get to a computer from America and Europe are doing projects and want to do something about the Church of Satan, but they get a list of questions from their teacher and they want us to just fill in the answers and then their project is done. We're like, no, we have a big website with a lot of information, read it. Yeah. And if you find something, if you can't you know, find the answers to it, like you can then give us questions and if we know the answers are there, we're gonna send you back to where the questions have answers. Uh, but uh, you know, with the different kind of journalists uh, who aren't really journalists anymore. There's just so many talk shows and uh, podcasts and such. And what I do is I find out whatever the, the kind of uh, predilection that the hosts have, and I pick different of our, our spokespeople to, to talk with them because I think they'll have some kind of familiarity with the kind of people, the kind of guests they have or the kind of topics that the hosts are interested in discussing. And I'll send folks out who really can sort of play in their ball field mm -hmm. and uh, maybe uh, sort of give them something that they'll feel comfortable dealing with because they, they generally aren't broadly educated people these days. They have very narrow cast kind of understandings of things. And we have so many spokespeople that are really eloquent at this point that, uh, you know, we, I put them out there. It's, it's, and at this point too, for me, I'm not going out there to answer the same old questions again and again. Uh, Anton LaVey gave up doing it like fairly soon after he got, you know, he said, like, I've had enough of this shit. Uh, you know, I've said it a million times. I've got a, you know, a bunch of books, read my books. Like I'm not going to spoon feed you this. And, you know, after running this for 15 years, I feel the same way. You know, I was answering those questions back when Anselm LeVay was alive, you know, cause he said, you know, you please do this for me. You do it great. Like I don't want to answer these anymore. And I'm setting up people to do that myself. You know, it's like, you're a, a wonderful exemplar of that. You can talk to people and you can present the philosophy and show how you've applied it because you're you're not only somebody who understands it you actually have been successful applying the philosophy and those are the kind of people that that i've been cultivating for many years to be able to do this and i'm so proud that i have somebody like you amongst them uh, who can do this so well thank you um i do want to talk a little bit about the management of the religion uh, as well in the context of well the fact that there are modern religious movements that crop up in our lifetimes and they always seem to run into some real problems, you know, much like ours did um, in the 80s. Uh, but some of them are sort of slipping by the wayside. So, you know, just for example, um, Scientology, uh, you know, that had, it had a good run. <laughs> but it's kind of on the way out now as popular culture shines a light on it. Uh, even the LDS religion that I was raised into, um, that's... You know, people are realizing how bigoted it truly is and how it's really just a business and it's not even really a religion, much like Scientology. Why do you think the Church of Satan is able to thrive 50 years later without these constant um, uh, problems that these other modern religions have? I think basically it's because we're not a bait and switch like they are. Uh, what we give you is what we are, like what, what's in the Satanic Bible and what's in all the subsequent literature that Dr. LeVay wrote and that I've written, Blanche has written, and things that Peggy's written, and all the rest of our hierarchy. All that we put out is consistent. There's no hidden dimension. You don't join and suddenly find it's something else. It's not meant to, to build people out of money. Uh, I think if, out of all the religions that exist, like what people have to do financially to be part of this is really quite minimal. It's, it's really simply just there to, to make people actually have to make a decision and say, all right, I'll put a little money into this because I actually mean to, but it's not any more than they'd spend on shoes or entertainment or food, you know, for like a, you know, less than a week. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's not set up to be something other than what it is. Hmm. It's not phony on any level. 
And I think that's uh, that that reaches people. Like they can keep coming because it's it's not changing. Uh, with Anton Lavey's passing, we didn't change the organization. We didn't change the philosophy. Uh, it's I was starting to elaborate on it even when he was alive to to put it to areas that he hadn't, and he encouraged that and still encourages it from our people because he's one man. He has one lifetime. He can't apply Satanism to absolutely every single aspect that it could you know be used for. So that's our job, and. Uh, we do it, but it, it's again, it's it's consistent. There's nothing hidden to it. It's it's exactly what it is. Read the book; it's still the same. Church of Satan, Satanism. Here we go. <laughs> nothing fooling you here. Yeah. And we also don't. I mean, we've told people over and over again that our religion doesn't require membership in the Church of Satan. You can be a Satanist and not be a member of the Church of Satan. And. Um, you don't. Uh, it's not like these other religions where, when you turn your back against them, you know, you know, you're anathema and you're, uh, you know, broken from your family. You know, we don't do things like that. Um, there's no necessity for that. So, well, also we don't. Too, right. I think that's a really important aspect because almost every other religion really does. They're trying to get people out there and suck them on in. And we turn people away. Like folks come to us and, and say, well, you know, I think I, I could be a Satanist. And by how they ask things and what they seem interested in, it becomes really evident to us very fast that they're not. They're often some kind of a cultist or they're just some kind of spiritual person. And they're just looking for something different from what they have because they've gotten bored with where they are. And we just say, this isn't for you. This is something that's a religion that challenges you to be self-reliant. And if you're constantly looking for somebody else to be telling you what to do, then this is really not the place to no. be. I... This just, this just popped in my head just now. Do you think that that's why there, there's so much... We get so much communication from third world countries. And I'm sure the organization gets a ton more than just individual members that are out. But oh, yeah. you get so much communication from these third world countries dying to um, become a member or get the power of Satan or whatever it is. <laughs> they all want to sell their soul and yeah. fuck yeah. who they want to and be rich and famous. Yeah. But do they you all think, for that. Do you think a, a society needs to um, have developed to a certain point in order to even comprehend a religion like Satanism? I think so. Um, because you have to have something to rebel against. Um, and, you know, our central figure is the rebel, mm. you know, the accuser, the adversary. And I think you, you need to have a, a kind of a sophisticated understanding of what you're doing when you identify with that figure. What do you think? Well, the other thing, too, is like the third world people just want wish fulfillment. Yeah. And, you know, they believe that there's some kind of supernatural daddy in the sky or, or whatever, many daddies, many mommies. They, they are just they don't have the concept that you get off your ass and make the world over according to your will. They expect that everybody's going to be giving them a handout. So if God's not going to give them a handout, maybe Satan will. Mm -hmm. uh, their life is based on getting handouts. And this whole, the world has always been like that, but it's it's worse now because so many governments just basically support so many people who are parasites who, who just wait to get everything that they, they have and don't make it for themselves that we've got this, this condition of having so many people who really just... They think if they ask, they'll get it, and they just have to ask the right direction to get what they want. And so we're we're just on the chain of things that they're asking. <laughs> like it's like, well, I tried God, no. I tried Buddha, no. I tried, you know, uh, Allah, no. Let's see if Satan's gonna. Well, Satan, you know, he's you know seems to like be about partying and having a good time, so maybe he'll give me all this stuff I want. And we're like, no. <laughs> Satan tells you you got to get off your ass and do it yourself. Yeah. And it's like, ah! Well, I didn't want to hear that, so... That's yeah. what I always loved about the idea of Satanism that was so different than anything else, is that we don't want you more for most of the cases. Like, most everyone, everyone else is like, yeah, come on in, come on in. Get under the tent. It's nice and warm. And we're just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you don't meet the criteria, I don't want anything. To, I love that. We, we're discerning. And, and I think that's another reason why... Um, the organization has sustained. Of course, the, the fundamental principles are so dramatically different, but whenever a modern religion sort of begins to fall apart, it's always from the inside. Whenever Satanism has been attempted to be destroyed, it's from the outside in. And, and I think that's an interesting 
notes that you never see anywhere else. It's always the outside in with us. We're never blowing up from the inside because we live our lives. We're not about trying to fit a mold or or become one, you know, with each other or whatever it is. I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, well, where would I mean, where would it start um, with a satanic high priest? Like, what would he be doing wrong that would suddenly be um, so so shocking to the members? Like, it's um, lighting a candle to Mary. I, I just don't know what it would be, you know, because we don't have any pretense to some kind of moral, you know, authority. Um, it, we we don't establish nonprofit. Um, funds to take care of things or or help anybody so it's like i don't yeah, we're not you know, hiding money in offshore you know, bank for? accounts or because, you know, we don't but even if we were it'd be like well, well we are safe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know yeah, we, we didn't say we were starting an orphanage I mean, yeah exactly <laughs> and that kind of goes to the piece that we just put up recently uh, on the website uh, well, recently to when we're recording this uh, the hoisted by his own patois piece that uh, when uh, Michael Aquino left the Church of Satan he kind of accused Anne Pallavay of like not having the infernal mandate given by the Prince of Darkness and and his whole it all started with him disputing an article that was simply about how you could get elevated in the Church of Satan and it, the Church of Satan is about celebrating materialism and carnality and indulgence and rationality, and uh, so people were getting degrees, you know, hey, you give Anton LaVey a Maserati, and you could be a, you know, get a priesthood perhaps, you know, because because it shows that you can apply Satanism, like you've been successful enough in your life to not only be able to, to purchase such things, but that you could actually give them to somebody, you know, that, that you know, you've established himself, yourself, you, you've applied the principles. So Satanism has always been about rewarding people who use the principles, not some kind of spiritual ideal or parodying facts or something. And that again makes us different from other religions. Uh, because uh, usually it's it's about like do you know the rote of the catechism right. and in satanism it's like no it's how you use the catechism right. that we we judge our members yeah. and that's a big challenge so few people can yeah. really live being up to able that. to sit and answer 20 questions about every mythological figure in the history of demonic and satanic figures is nice but it doesn't make you a better satanist um than somebody who can sit down at a, a poker table and win, you know, the whole pot. You know, I I kind of, you know, I beg to differ about which one is more satanic at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, and that was the problem. That was, a, like, I would have to say that was the crux of the, the problem, that yeah. there was a def definitely an element of members in the church at that time, small but determined and loud, um, that felt that they were somehow um, superior to the other members because they had a lot more book learning hmm. about uh, irrelevant occultism. occultic, yeah. you know, crapola. Yeah, well, Dr. Levy would go to somebody who owned three restaurants and they give him a meal at one of their, their best restaurants and he'd be like, you're a really successful Satan. Yeah, you're a magister. Who you else? Know? Like, how else? You've mastered this thing. Like, I don't have anything to teach you. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and you know we still approach it that way. Uh, again, what we try is very fair in evaluating people how they develop themselves. Like, we're not stacking everybody up against each other, going, "Oh, if you made more this year than that one, you know, you're a higher ranking." It's all about how you're you're using what you have to your best advantage, and and doing great things with that. And I think for so so again, people, we don't have some one standard for all. We're an individualist philosophy, so we apply our judgments to people based on what kind of individual they are, yeah. and how they're they're actualizing themselves, and how and the things they've overcome. Because not everyone has the same challenges. Yeah, that too, like, absolutely. Um, well, stepping back a little bit to the idea of. Uh, the problems of managing uh, an organization. Uh, we went through this, uh, we, <laughs> you went through the satanic panic, which was, uh, I'm sure, a, a horrible time for any administration uh, trying to defend base, baseless accu accusations. Um, what, because we live in a world that communication has evolved so much differently, if something like that were to happen again, how would you treat it? How, how would you approach that same type of, or something similar um, type of situation, a, a satanic panic type situation? 
Well, you know, back then the way we approached it, I mean, I approached it because I, I came, became a it media represent, representative yeah. and spent hours and hours of my time. There would sometimes I'd do three interviews a day, uh, you know, <laughs> depending on, on where the around the world. Yeah, I was on the radio constantly. A lot. We then. have. Um, we really should digitize a lot. Of we don't have a lot of it. It just kind yeah. of went out. Uh, but uh, the point was to get information out there that was correct. Mm -hmm. And that when somebody was on a talk show saying, well, you know, I sacrificed babies for Satan <laughs> to be there and go like, really? Well, that's murder and there is no statute of limitations. So um, I think we should really let the police know. And if you actually have any real evidence, you're going to jail. <laughs> uh, most of these people are but I found the Lord, so it's okay now. And it's like, no, that's not how the law works. Uh, which shut a lot of them up eventually. Uh, but nowadays, we try to sort of nip it in the bud, kind of, because uh, if anything seems to be going in that direction, like we kind of step in and we have, say an article shows up somewhere where somebody's claiming that's going on. Like our spokespeople go in there and they either go re directly to the reporter if they can, or they go to the comments section, say, look, here's the Church of Satan, go to the website, here's all this information. Like we can get information out to people like like instantaneously mm -hmm. because we have this bank of information in churchofsatan.com. I think that's that's really such an important thing like that we got that website together and we've talked about doing a website before Anton LaVey died with him and that we, we've made it this kind of bedrock that's out there for anybody worldwide to access so they can know the truth about Satanism. And, and that serves us so very well, regardless of, of what's cropping up anywhere. Like, that's our tool. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's incredibly effective, too. I mean, I think Google Alerts alone is like, like, ironically, it's a godsend because you can instantaneously be informed when lies are being spread about uh, not only the religion, but the organization or individuals or whatever. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, we, and we step in. I mean, if you look... Like, like uh, I and others in the hierarchy, you know, make comments on things like that when it shows up. Like there was, you know, some sheriff got up and accused somebody of being like, you must be in the church of Satan somewhere. Oh, well, we found that. And we jumped right in. They said, no, no, no. Like that's, that's, you know, the church of Satan exists and that's not anything about what we're about. Or, you know, when that uh, Amanda Barber, that crazy girl who went on like a crime spree with her boyfriend murdering people, she came out and said, you know, she belonged to this cult and she killed all these people and it started in Alaska. It was all nonsense. But we immediately were like, you know, bang, no, that's not anything to do with it. The Church of Satan has nothing to do with it. Satanism doesn't work that way. And this girl's just like, you know, and of course the FBI investigator, she was just full of it. She, she is, she was a murderer. She and her boyfriend to kill somebody. But uh, everything else was just crazy attempts to get attention for herself and make her seem like some kind of celebrity. Like, I guess she'd watch natural born killers too much or something. <laughs> yeah. So I, then do you think that it's even possible for a situation like that to legitimately rise again, the satanic panic? Well, you know, it depends on what the government is under which you're living. Uh, if you have a government that's dominated by people who want to make it into a theocracy, mm -hmm. then it's not a satanic panic. Then you're just fish in a barrel. Because, uh, you know, our members who are in Islamic countries, they have to be completely underground or they'd be killed. And if that happened here, like say, say you know, the, we became some kind of Christian right wing insane uh, dictatorship, then we'd all have to like say, well, you know, God's wonderful. Thank you. And, you know, and then keep our altars hidden or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, however we need to go underground to keep living and enjoying our lives and manipulating them, we'd have to do or move someplace else where it hadn't happened. You know, the moving towards more freedom is not granted to anyone. In fact, the kind of freedoms that we have in our societies are, are unprecedented in all of human history. Mm -hmm. And they're very fragile and they're quite ephemeral. And things do go backwards because when we were in high school in the seventies, we had a much freer environment to express ourselves than the kids have now. I'm shocked at what kids are not allowed to do in school. They're not allowed to wear certain t-shirts. They're not allowed to wear certain kinds of jewelry. Or symbols. The symbols. When we were in high school, we were like, forget it. We wore crazy costumes and, and nutty clothes and satanic symbols and dressed in black. And, and like, we, we, I mean, our teachers were all hippies. So they were all just like, hey, that's beautiful. The, the kids are all so creative, you know? So, yeah. you know, I, I'm astonished when people tell me, well, we, we're not allowed to wear those things to school. I'm like, what do you mean not allowed? Hmm. You're 16 years old. You go to a public school. How They can't tell you how to dress. 
Oh, they can, and they do. And the thing is, that kind of censorship comes both from the right and the left. Oh, like yeah. on the right, you find the Christians wanting to shut up anybody who isn't Christian. And on the left, you have people who are just afraid of any kind of difference of opinion. And you know, we're afraid of being triggered. It's like, what, is everybody a bunch of pussies? Like, you can't yeah. hear something that you don't understand or, or, or don't agree with, and that's gonna like melt you? Like the whole point to, to any kind of education is to be challenged by different ideas and to explore them and evaluate them. You might find something Something that's more valuable than what you're holding to now and and if it's not something that you want then you ex understand what it is and why it isn't for you but but that's lost now and so we, we're really in this this terrible position i think especially for people in education of from both ends of the spectrum everybody's you know freedom is being shut down and it's grotesque it's really grotesque and we didn't expect this really uh, you know but but again the pendulum always swings and uh, you know we were at a time of great freedom uh, in the 70s when we were in, in, in high school it was really kind of uh, a tolerant time when I you know the the, the um, the born again Christians did the Easter presentation that was like about the passion of the Christ in our social studies class, and it was full of very weepy readings of the Bible and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, so it was like, okay, you know, that was their thing, fine. So I said to the teacher, I said, can I do a presentation? I'm a Satanist, and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to play music and I'm going to read from the Satanic Bible and explain what it's about. And he's like, sure. So I put Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring on, and I read sections of the Satanic Bible, and people literally freaked out. Uh, but uh, and, and parents heard about it and contacted the principal of the school. Uh, but the, the principal and, and everybody stood, stood up and said, no, this is absolutely what we're about. People can have their points of view. And, and his point of view didn't say anything about forcing you all into anything. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, how it goes. So, you know, I don't think you could do that these days. No, I don't. Yeah, it's well, I even noticed it just over just over a decade ago um, in college when they were talking in a humanities class about some of the biblical stories and, you know, just Noah. And the teacher said, we will not criticize any of these stories. So whether it's Greek Egyptian myth or modern Christian myth, modern Christian myth, um, you are not allowed to give an opinion on that. And that blew my mind. Like I'm in college. That's what you're here for literally is to give opinions and discover truths and test and question and, but not anymore. It's interesting. Yeah, it's very sad. It's sad. Um, how do you approach the notion uh, when you have uh, individual Satanists, even active members who behave less than professionally in the media or uh, the real world? So I'm, I'm backing up here to the administration part of it again. Well, it all depends on, you know, the like that's a very broad concept, right. uh, you know, because everybody's allowed to, I mean, not allowed, they're, it's basic fundamental approach of Satanism is that you live the way you want to and, and you know, express yourself the way you want to. We're about freedom and individualism. Uh, the people that I cultivate as spokespersons for the Church of Satan uh, generally find their own style for doing it. Uh, if somebody was not doing it to, to my satisfaction, uh, I wouldn't have them speaking for us anymore. So, uh, but people are out there and they're free to do whatever kind of creativity they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as they're not saying they're speaking on behalf officially of the Church of Satan, they're free to do it. Uh, I think that we've got enough really great and professional things going on. I mean, when we look at, uh, we've had uh, Radio Free Satan, the podcast uh, aggregate show that's music and, and discussions and things, that's been going on for over 15 years now. You know, and that, that's evolved. I mean, there were certainly shows on there that weren't the best and, you know, they either evolved or got dumped. And uh, it's under new ownership recently and is, is actually tightening ever much and being that much more about being professional and the various things that you, that you do online. And, you know, you've got a really professional approach and you're constantly striving to be better and you know, John Shaw's entered that ring and is doing a lot of interesting things. And uh, we, we just have great people out there. And I, I think that, you know, it comes down to whether people are doing it in the name of the Church of Satan or in the name of their own selves. Yeah, if they're on their own page and their own feed and they're acting stupid, that's on them. I, that's not, you know, that's not for us to determine. If they're in my group and they act up, then I just kick them out. Yeah. That's it. My group, my rules. I, I find it interesting because I, I do run across it quite a bit of Satanists complaining about how other Satanists represent themselves 
So you must get hit up with that a lot. And you alluded to it earlier in our discussion here. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I ignore it. <laughs> but I do. I mean, I, I do. It's like, it's none of your business. That's, it's really, it has to be like that. Mm -hmm. Because um, unless the person committed a crime against you or something, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not your mom. What like, the thought police yeah, are. Yeah, they call you me mama Satan, but I'm not your mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to, you know, sit here and, uh, you know, you get in that corner and you get in that corner, although sometimes it literally comes down to that. Um, it's just not, you know, we're not here to tell adults how to deal with each other. I assume but by now they know how to do that. Well, I also kind of made it very clear uh, about the organization that it's a mutual admiration society. And the whole point is you don't have to deal with anybody else in the organization. You have to like them. Mm -hmm. But my requirement is that you don't go out there and trash them because yeah. this is not going to be a, 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 what was it the encounter group concept that Antelope hated so much that was something that was very prominent in the 60s that's where people got together and just tore each other to shreds the idea that then they'd be shattered and could rebuild themselves right and he said satanism isn't about that we're about building ourselves up and, and celebrating what's great in each other and the thing is if you find something you don't want to celebrate anything about them then just pay no attention yeah, to them there's it's no like obligation. turn the channel yeah. it's like that whole concept that they used to have like you know like it turn, turn the, the channel. channel you don't have to yeah. watch it and nobody's making you What's, do this you know you all have the ability on that little social network you're all on not you Adam but anyone else um just block them mm -hmm. don't don't listen to them don't read them don't respond to them no obligation there but also don't consider them the sole representative of the organization we've had people leave the uh, church of satan because they don't like other people in the church person, of satan and they can't tolerate it they just can't tolerate that though that they're in this the same group the same organization as this person and um you know maybe somewhere in the past uh you know maybe if they laid on the floor and held their breath long enough they got that <laughs> donut, but it ain't getting it from me um not, nobody's going to scream loud and long enough for me to throw someone else out of the organization to make them happy mm -hmm. Just not going to happen. Yeah. So there, you know, people, again, people are always welcome to leave. The door is open and it does swing both ways. So, but if, if you're in here because you have to feel that everybody else in this organization lives up to your personal standards, then you pick the wrong organization. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, let's do a little bit of detractor talk. <laughs> Detracted talk. Um, how often have you run across uh, the the experience of, of members leaving and then trying to run away with the religion on their own? I don't think it's happened. You know, I mean, people are always doing that. They leave, but most of them fall, you know, trip and fall like they, you know, step on their dicks and land in the mud pretty quick because really they're the kind of people who think their genius hasn't been realized and recognized and celebrated. So it's like, well, you know, good luck to you. Go, go out and see what you can drum up on your own. And they're usually kind of laughable when they try to do that. Um, and, and the thing is, sometimes if, if they actually could do something worthwhile, they would be celebrated here. There's plenty of people to celebrate them. Yeah. It's been ongoing, though, through the history of the organization that it's kind of worked that way. Like, But they're, they're not many. It's really kind of a handful say, of people. Yeah, I, I would say that the more, more significant of a trend rather than larger or smaller is people who leave and then claim they know what Anton LaVey really believed, that he talked to them personally, and even though it's nowhere in his writings or his interviews or letters or anywhere, they had a little conversation with him, and he told them the truth about his beliefs in Satanism, and they're going to share that with the rest of the world. And uh, there's been several people who have done that. Um, and. It's so it's and it's like you think by now they'd be like I I'm like do you really want to be another one of those because it's it's just it's a joke mm -hmm. I mean why would Anton Lavey share his deep innermost feelings with you about in, worshiping Satan instead of with Blanche Barton or one of us like doesn't make sense I'm trying to understand that. Do you do you think, and I don't really want to explore this long, but do you think their motivation is that they just want to be recognized? They want to be in a position of authority or they genuinely feel like this organization isn't what it's supposed to be? It's not what it's supposed to be because they're supposed to be running it. 
Right. So that's their that's their motivation. Yeah. It was I was supposed to be the special one at the top of the heap, and um, and both Satan and Anton so, LeVay recognized that. So I withdraw my mandate of <laughs> Peggy and Peter in the Church of Satan because you know I'm mad. So um, you know it sound familiar? Yeah. Does, yeah. That's how it goes. It's it's like a syndrome. Yeah, but you know what the thing is? There's as as time moves on, there are less and less people who have spend time with Anton LaVey who come to the Church of Satan because they come to it from reading the literature and dealing with the people who are in it now. And so there's there's far less candidates to pull that kind yeah. of nonsense. Um, and that's the beauty of it is that we have that book. We have the Satanic Bible. We have a primary text from which all else flows. Mm -hmm. um, we also have wonderful subsequent books that have been written and consistently expound on the philosophy. And at some point, the personalities involved are just moot. It's the philosophy that survives. Hmm. And that's that's the way it should be and the way I hope it continues. Yeah, well, see, I mean, even with the personalities thing, like part of the thing with some people who would leave the organization, they, they come to it and read, uh, you know, Anton LaVey's writings and go, wow, I love this. Then they'll go read somebody's, some detractor's accounts of Anton LaVey, like, oh, he didn't bathe enough and, and you know, he didn't, you know, t take the dog on and off walks. So he's a terrible person. So I can't be interested in this philosophy anymore because Anton LaVey is such a horrible person. And the whole point is, well, you can't even be sure that what you're hearing about him has any validity because it's coming from somebody with an agenda. But second of all, if the philosophy works for you, then it's a philosophy that works for you. Uh, it, it's like when you deal with, say, listening to the music of Wagner. Now, he was, by all accounts, a pretty like rotten person, and he's a you know anti-Semite and a blustery, you know, bastard. Uh, but he wrote some of the most beautiful music ever created in all human history. And so you kind of have to like say, well, I don't care what a creep he was. He wrote awesome music, and, and that's 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 really how you have to take things. It's not about somebody's personality. You have to like everything about somebody. You'd be like, oh, he he liked chocolate cake, and I don't like chocolate cake, so I can't be. <laughs> I mean, it's really that silly, you know, because it's it's like, and Antelope was really specific about saying that he had. He didn't want to be put on a pedestal, that what he liked were the things that he liked. And he might spend more time with people who liked the same kind of things that he liked and not with others for that reason. But it was a personal preference. It wasn't that he looked down on somebody who didn't want to go to a gun show or a reptile show or something like that. Uh, but he said that you are Satanism. In your world, you apply it. You're your own god. Like the idea of being an atheist is such a critical and such uh, a difficult thing for some people to achieve. I think that's why real Satanists are always going to be a niche, because that's the most challenging point, I think, in all human philosophies, our atheist perspective. Right. Do you think when we do run across um, either a resurgence of, of detractors, like the Aquino uh, stuff lately, or, or Aquino, or however you pronounce it, um, or TST a little while back, do you think that social media, this advance in communication, um, is the reason why they have legs that last longer than others in the past? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, stuff just gets out there very easily. But also, there's enough evidence, I think we present plenty of evidence, so the people who really care mm -hmm. can get to the bottom of things. But that's the whole point. I think a lot of people just want to, they, it's like reading, you know, what were those those Hollywood scandal magazines and stuff? You know, pe people just want a scandal and want to get all puffed up and go, well, look at that, harumph, harumph, harumph. And they don't really care about what's really going on. Like, facts don't mean anything to a lot of people. They just want to be entertained. Yeah. And it's... It's another thing that, like, on the, you know, let's entertain, be entertained. You know, Anton LaVey wrote that piece, Get a Life. And the whole point is the Church of Satan isn't here to entertain you. And we get people writing to us all the time going, where's the local Church of Satan I want to attend services? And the whole point is, is, is it doesn't work that way. It's not about services. But people want that. Like, they want to go to a church and have somebody putting on a show that will take up an hour of their time and stimulate them. And, and they don't want to pay for membership either because it's like, well, why should I pay to be part of the religion? But they, that's just what they expect. They, they want Brighton circuses for free, uh, you know, from the Church of 
Satan because their lives are empty. Like the, the, a real Satanist wouldn't have time for that kind of nonsense. Uh, but most people who are typical adherents of other religions, that's what their religions give them. They give them time where they're being entertained and occupied. And the Church of Satan is about occupying yourself. Yeah. You know, the, you had talked about how the organization's door swings both ways and membership is based on application. Um, I mean, the application process to become a member. Has that process changed at all since the beginning of the organization? No, um, it hasn't changed. Uh, you still have to register for membership and then um, submit <clears throat> uh, uh, answers to a questionnaire for what we call active membership. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that the active membership application has changed a lot. Um, and evolved. It hasn't changed in a long time, but in the early days, it, there were several, like quite shockingly different versions of it, which I've only now discovered and started cataloging. I mean, the the classic application that we're all that you filled out and that I filled out it hasn't changed. It's forty questions, and it's been that way since the seventies. But in the early days, there was a, a twenty question version. There was a sixty five question version. There was a hundred and twenty question ver version, um, which is like I'm looking at it going a hundred and twenty questions. Um, but, and a lot of the questions are like, I, I'm a little embarrassed by them because they're kind of like, like which astrological sign uses the symbol of the ram? It's like, oh. <laughs> you know, meh. and I'm so glad that, uh, you know, somewhere along the way they're like, this was crap. I'm like, yeah. what are we doing this for? Well, but part of it too, I think was tongue in cheek. I think, you know, the cultics, the occultic questions, if people obsessed over that in their ancestors, in their answers, they'd be like, oh, this is an occult, Nick. And if they said, I don't know what the hell that is, they'd be like, oh, that's better. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is like answering the question correctly may have been the wrong thing. You know, that may have been held against you. Yeah. Like it all depended on who was evaluating it at the time. Yeah. Like we don't pull any like, you know, tricks like that no. in our, our, you know, our, our, the questions are just descriptive. They're yeah, just mostly. about the person. It's, it's like, like, yeah. There are no trick questions. Create um, a self portrait for us until we yeah. can meet you and deal with you on some other level. Yeah. I guess that's really what it's about. It's, 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 it's portraiture. Yeah. It's a little bit, I always say it's a little bit of like a head flossing. Oh, but one other <laughs> thing though, like when you're talking about what changed uh, when the active applications are being evaluated, we do online searches for people. We do background yeah. searches. So that's something that wasn't available in earlier times, but we do have that and we do it. And people have been turned down, you know, based on things we've discovered about them. Do you think, uh, do you think that's a tool that <laughs> Lave wishes was around back in the day? Would have oh, wished. hell yeah. Yeah. He would have loved that. I think that. he would have liked that. <laughs> I also think he would have really liked the fact that we can search our email going back to 1996. Yeah. And uh, we find the most amazing things in there. <laughs> <laughs> so you oh. keep an email archive that far back? Oh, yeah. Our, our database is vast. Wow. Yeah. And we have it, and we're preserving it is one of our most important things. Because yeah. we'll have people, you know, who, who came to us at one point and were really like assholes, and then they, you know, insulted us, yeah, and, yelled and, at us. Then they come back, like, you know, and then 20 years later. They want to join. Hi. And I'm like, oh, hi. Isn't this you? <laughs> yeah, we're like, <laughs> I'll quote their emails back, and it's like, oops. That's one of my favorite things no. to do. <laughs> That always makes my day. I would love to be love on to the wall for that. <laughs> Remember that other face you used to have? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you get the humana, humana, humana. Uh oh. You know. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that is fun. That's one of our, <laughs> our great tools for that because it's like, yeah, we remember you. You pulled this nonsense. I love searchability. Yeah. So there's no reason. There should be no reason to change the way that things are running right now. You know, I mean, like you just mentioned, the 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 application process changed three times in the early days, and now, I mean, it's just down pat. Do you ever imagine it changing at all? I can't think of um, what would work better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't read into people's hearts. Um, I can't look into their souls. Uh, so, other than 
answering 40 questions and me doing a Google search, I don't know how better way I can find out about Chuck. Yeah, yeah I mean, and we, we base like, you know, again, if, if people have been dishonest with us on the application, that's like an immediate disqualification. Right. So it, it, it works. I mean, we've been doing pretty good. Sometimes people, you know, People do change. That's the other thing. Like people may present themselves in one way and then they evolve into something else. And at that point, we hope that they're honest enough to say, I'm not really into this anymore and we'll leave. And they do. I mean, we get a lot of people who join and we really never hear from them after they've sent in their, their stuff and they've gotten their membership packet. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes mysteriously, like years later, you get a get the card back with a little like, oh, I'm resigning, I'm going on to something else. We're like, we, we never really knew that much about you in the first place. Yeah. There's some people who never even filled out the active application. They just send in their money, got their card, and then later they just send the card back and we're like, whatever, you know. Wow. We don't know what their purpose was in joining. And we don't uh, really know why they left. Why they left. So, yeah. But they did hold on to that card. Yeah, sometimes for decades. So it must have meant something. Yeah, because it, it, it's a talisman, yeah. I think. It shows a commitment for people. And I think that's one of the things that satisfies folks when they join, because it's official. It's the Church of Satan. It's been out there. And, and by, by being part of it, you support it. And you can say, this is me. Um, and, and you have some kind of heft behind that. Because I think we, we've also had people over the years where there'll be somebody who gets in, in some kind of trouble where they're trying to do some kind of lawsuit. They've either done something at work or they're uh, dealing with, with some kind of situation where they feel they've been treated unfairly as a Satanist. And then they want to come to us and say, well, I shouldn't have been treated like that and you're going to stand behind me. And we'll be like, well, you were never a member. And how do we, you know, because if you're a member of the Church of Satan, you could, you, could, you could demonstrate in court that these are the principles that I'm upholding. And you have, a, you know, a whole literature that you can base anything on. So you could then present it in court, which has been done successfully, because I've also been consultant for lawsuits that have been successful from members. Uh, but if you, you, you're not a member, then it's kind of moot, because you could say, well, you call yourself a Satanist, but we can Google a bunch of other idiots out there calling themselves Satanists who all do all kinds of different crazy things. Yeah. So which one are you? And you can't pick and choose. So so that that's another strength of membership, is that yeah, you can use it in that kind of situation. That is the reason why like people say, well, why don't you want to affiliate with these other organizations can't you just affiliate with my satanic organization and the answer is no because we don't know what you believe yeah. or who you'd let in yeah we have no you know way to verify that uh, any of your beliefs are you know in any way consistent with our philosophy and it's like you're not gonna you know use us as your convincer Meanwhile, you're believing all kinds of kooky nonsense and doing whatever you want. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, too, is that there are people who are just, they, they, they've got to head something. So they'll try to say, well, we're just like the Church of Satan, but like, but I got to run it. Like, yeah. I got to be the head of it. Yeah. And it's just like, you're just reinventing the wheel and doing it badly. Yeah. Because Which what is... can you give to them that they, they can't get from us? Yeah. And unfortunately, that was the way... Um... Uh, the second the second incarnation of grottos tended to get that way. People uh, wanted to run their own little mini church of Satan and they used their grottos to, to do that and that was not good either. Well there are some people wanted you to join the grotto without being in the church of Satan. Like yeah. there were certainly people who were out there even trying to go online and create like 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 their grotto was a church of Satan. Yeah. Somehow it was like we were the authority, but then people would just join them and give them money and, yeah. and, and not be in the Church of Satan. I mean, we really had people do We had a grotto shit. mistress who uh, ran, uh, she had like these two side-by-side -side kind of deals she was running. She had an actual Church of Satan grotto that she applied for and everything, and it had like, you know, six or seven members. And then she did her online grotto that she basically let anyone with an email address and $20 join. And she was an attractive young lady, and she put up lots of sexy pictures of herself. So all these guys were joining yeah. it. <laughs> and it was, we were like, no, no, do that. Like, no. Like, that was literally letting them in under the tent flaps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Almost literally, because yeah, really. we don't have literal tent flaps. But that was what Dr. meant when he said letting them in under the tent flaps is giving people all the benefits of Church of Satan membership without them having to make any commitment to the Church of Satan or declare the true nature of their satanic beliefs. So that's the problem with, um, you know, that was, a, there was a tipping point with that, all of that. Yeah. yeah, well, we, we don't, and also there were some people who were out there trying to, uh, 
uh, formalize their grottos and incorporate them yeah. as something that they would own. And I actually had to be the enforcer and go out there and say, absolutely, you know, you're given a charter as a grotto master from the Church of Satan. It belongs to the Church of Satan, and we can remove it, which we are going to do now, <laughs> because I really don't understand, like, what your responsibilities are. Uh, but, but, you know, like, people really started to kind of run off and, and think that they were going to do their own kind of little, again, do their own little mini it's, church of Satan somehow it's just with a, us being their authority. They can't, there's some people that just can't wait to be the head of something and be the, the boss and the one calling the shots. And the whole grotto system gave them that opportunity. And it was just like, and the, no. and the irony behind it all is they are in charge of their own life if they just took control <laughs> Yes. It's crazy. Um, let's let's uh, wind the discussion down with a little bit of social media, my favorite topic. <laughs> um, just a few notes I want to hit here if I can. Um, it, it does seem like the flow of our culture is being controlled by social media and its focus on sharing information. Uh, opinions, news, fake news, it's all a focus of our lives, whether we read it, accept it, like it or not. Um, do you have any suggestions for Satanists on how to deal, how to navigate those waters? Wow. Well, you know, I, I said years ago when the internet first happened that the most important factor was going to be filtering the information for stuff that has value and, and actual truth. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we've gotten any better tools for that. I think that what we're challenged with is looking at what's coming in and trying to find factual corroboration for it. We have to find sources that we can trust but we have to always constantly question them to see if, if they're really giving us something that actually has value. Um, and because I think so many people live in a world, again, of like now we have this wonderful, under Donald Trump, this idea of alternative facts, mm -hmm. which is so grotesque uh, that, uh, but it's, I think it, it, it addresses a current situation that, that people really think that there are alternative universes happening simultaneously and that they can think that like, well, the world is like this and this one thinks the world is like that. And nobody's fact-checking. They, they don't say, well, no, actually, you know, these people do this and these people run that, these people kill these people. You know, it's like, it's not going on. And I think that the challenge for the Satanist, and it's an individual challenge, I don't think anybody can really help you with it, is to develop sources that you can trust. And uh, that's not easy. And I think that's going to be the ongoing struggle for people dealing with social media and the internet is to be finding uh, the truth about the people you're dealing with because people always are creating masks in their profiles on various levels. So you don't know really what you're dealing with. And, uh, and the media is just presenting all kinds of things, mostly for infotainment. I kind of think that we're, we're in a position now where, uh, because we're having issues with our government, questions of, of foreign powers, perhaps interfering in our elections and such, that uh, the media now may have to actually be more uh, responsible. They're going to actually yeah. have to analyze statements for their factuality rather than being, it's, oh, it's really turned into infotainment, I'd say, in the last decade. And and, and the idea of like Walter Cronkite or, yeah. or uh, you know, Edward R. Murrow coming out there and really giving you the real and deal is gone. They've divested themselves of the responsibility. They, um, I read this on, you know, this website. I'm just reporting this forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not taking any um, responsibility for the veracity of what they're reporting. And they should. Like, every journalist that was, you know, that's paramount. When you're reporting something, you should be able to stand behind it. And journalism has, a like, a history. That's, the, that's our sacred, you know, vow to do that, not to, to report crap, but to report truth. That's what the, the entire role of the press is. And they've totally, you know, just well, shrugged that off. It. But they it, may, it may come back now. Yeah, it, this is their chance. Can they redeem their entire um, profession? Can they do it? Can they save the world? Because that's really what they need to do now. Yeah, it's, it's more important now than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because we've, we've really gotten to a point where Again, it became just whatever anybody said somewhere was given validity and no one examined things. And now they've got to examine things like people are examining politicians and uh, and, and, and no, any kind of characters, businessmen, whatever, anybody who's out there, whatever they're going to be saying. I think we're starting to see the journalists having to challenge what's being handed to them and, and examining it. And I think that's a good thing. I think that'll be the best thing that comes out of what's going yeah. on in the world these days mm -hmm. is that we might get to a point where the media is actually trying to deal with discovering and uncovering evidence and presenting facts 
and letting you then evaluate them and make your own decision. I, there'll still be a lot of you know, media pundits telling people what to think. Uh, it's way out of control, you know, at this point with like figureheads for left and right saying, it's this, it's this, and people going, of course it is. And I, I think that the satanic perspective of thinking for yourself is, is so crucial for our culture. And that's why Satanism is an important religion because we, we challenge people to create their own standards and to, to look for information and make judgments because judgments are crucial. And uh, our religion is that much more important, uh, more important today maybe than when it was even founded in 1966. Uh, moving back to the idea of uh, individual Satanists in social media, uh, Imagine Dreamy, you had mentioned that you're not uh, individual Satanists mom, you know, you are not the parents in order to mediate. Do you think that the the social media itself, the, the availability to communicate so easily encourages that thought that you are in fact arbiters, you are in fact parents that should be, you know, tapped on the shoulder every time a boo-boo occurs? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Well, it, it makes it easy, but I think it's also easy for us to sort of then say, well, that's not our thing. You know, this is for you to decide. So I, I think that the accessibility is a good thing. Uh, and we're responsive in our communications. Like we don't like let things sit around for months before we deal with them. So uh, we can kind of guide people often to finding their own solutions. Uh, and we can do it pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. So it, what it's I effective. Like, what I like about it is I can keep up with people's creative projects and the things they do and, and literally see through their pictures they post and the videos they put up of, of what they're doing. And um, it's very interesting to me and fun. And I keep track of who's who that way. And uh, I, in that sense, it, it serves me very well. Um, the conversations they get into with each other, it's really none of my business. And if they try to make it my business, I usually shut it down pretty fast. But there are also people who do get close to us and we do mentor them. And they're, they're usually like people who are doing things that are close to our hearts. And if they want the benefit of our experience and, and our, our knowledge, then we're very happy to give it wherever we can. I, we, we do, I guess on some level, we do foster the, the parent thing because we do mentor people. Um, they, but the people that we mentor are people who you know approach us and befriend us. And, and then we're happy to give of our time. Yeah. Um, do you have any final uh, thoughts on, uh, or maybe suggestions on Satanists not necessarily navigating through social media news or fake news or opinion journalism, but just general suggestions on navigating through social media itself, uh, maybe best practices? Well, I, you know, I'm sure I'll sound like everybody's uh, cranky old aunt or the librarian or something, but I just say less is more. Just keep it, you know, block people you don't like, keep your own little circle of groups. You, the, that application allows for all of that. There's really no reason to interact with anyone in social media that you don't want to interact with. So keep it small, get off of the damn thing, like regularly, go read a book, ride your bike, you know, don't be on it all the time, obviously. But I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one that says that. Um, that's not unique advice. Um, yeah, less is more. Do less of it, keep it smaller, and uh, get off the damn thing. Yeah. Well, I, I really genuinely appreciate both of your time. Um, I know we had a few missteps trying to <laughs> have this come to realization, but I do genuinely appreciate it. So thank you so much for uh, joining me and speaking of the devil. Well, thank you for your thoughtful questions. Yeah, it was really good. We always enjoy communicating with you, and you end up really helping us get interesting ideas out to people that we hope will stimulate them. I appreciate that. Uh, until we can talk again, until we can chat again, hail Satan. Hail, hail Satan. Satan.